Aloha, I'm Paul Deloria for the Maui Pono Network, and we're here with some of our team members with Senator Angus McKelvey. Uh, uh, Asia is not here right now, she is in Japan, and will be joining us next week. But uh, Angus, welcome, uh, nice to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. I appreciate you, appreciate being here and talking story with you guys, as always. Great. Well, th there's, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to really start to learn a little bit more about some of the bills that are happening right now in our state house. And uh, certainly there's been a lot of concern and controversy around one that is circulating around that you were one of the authors of. And uh, again, Bill 3381, uh, I think mm -hmm. is, has really uh, raised a lot of concerns uh, in terms of the impact and the uh, you know, the scope of what is being proposed at this point in time. And I guess there, there must be a reasoning behind this, uh, yeah, first of all. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, my bad. No, I just want to, I just would like to know then, what were some of the reasoning behind actually putting this bill out in the first place? And what well, was the intention? I was, I was born and raised in Lahaina. And for years, you know, it's come up about every 20 years or so, more autonomy for the West Side. You know, for years, we were 15 percent before the fire of the state's entire GDP, one of the biggest drivers of revenue in all of Maui County, yet decisions are made by and political entities that are not based in West Maui, in Wailuku, in Honolulu, and of course elsewhere. So the idea was, you know, let Lahaina lead. What, what would that look like? What could that look like? What made that look like? And so one of the ideas in my mind was one of the apparatuses to create a self-governing entity, if you will, that has control over the fiscal money for an area is the community development authority structure, which or the HCDA structure. And the reason why is because that's a community structure, governance structure that has basically the ability to make the decisions and control where money and other types of decisions and planning are done for the community at the local level. So that's why I put the bill in. And when we talked about it, you know, in one of the, I call it tent talk or tarp talk after the fires, like, you know, we're going to revision Lahaina. You know, can we bring a Lahaina back that we used to know as Keiki? Can we have, can we bring back Moka'ula? Can we go, is it going to be a, a place where the money coming in, the state money especially, coming in will be controlled by one person, the governor in Honolulu, will be controlled by a group of advisors of 93 people who are meeting right now as we speak, or will it be controlled at the local level? But there's a lot of issues and concerns, and rightfully so, with creating this kind of governance structure, especially since how it's going to interact with other existing structures and with the community as a whole. And so that was why I put the bill in and the house didn't schedule it. And so the bill's dead. And so it's not going to advance anymore for the year. But I think, you know, we had, it was, I, I'm glad we had the conversation, you know, but I think at the state level is where we see the biggest separation of government, where we see money allocated, where we just see decisions being made on state, assets within Maui County, West Maui, and yet they're done in Honolulu. And I, I can point to our small boat harbors. For years, the community's been screaming for Mala Ramp to become a community recreational ramp right now. And right now, it's a commercial ramp. And absent any kinds of changes, it's going to be DLNR and Dobor who's going to decide if that ramp goes back to the community or not. Whereas in if a community authority like a Lahaina authority or Lele authority, as it was named in the bill, was had that decision and could see the community wanted the Mala Ramp to be a community resource with no commercial activity, then the planning and money for Mala Ramp would be done in accordance with that vision. And that was kind of the idea. But, and, but, but there's a lot of a lot of there's a lot of issues behind it. For instance, the interaction with the county is the biggest one. And then there was the concern of one of the abilities this entity would have would be the ability to do condemnation in eminent domain, which, of course, a lot of people were really upset and freaked out about. And to that, I say it's already happening now. The county can condemn an eminent domain and has great plans to do so within line. And so and the question then becomes that eminent domain condemnation decision, which exists right now, 
No bill right now is going to be decided by nine people, eight of whom are not from West Maui. And one of the eight who's from West Maui is still elected by everybody. And wouldn't you rather have that kind of a very, you know, consequential discussion being done at the community level instead of the planning commission level and the county council level? So that's kind of I, the idea I, I, of I, why I, we try to do it. I agree. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of us who are more progressive would say that, yes, we want to empower that whole district so that the residents can make the decisions for their future. But the way it was set up, though, 3381, uh, the oversight was happening from the state uh, Department of Business, Economic Development and the uh, Tourism. So mm. these were the entities that uh, at least uh, the you know, that would be in power uh, no. for that. No, was that? No, it, was, it, was, no, it wouldn't. It, it's a, it's a HCDA is attached for administrative purposes only to DBED. They have no, it's a merely just, everything has to be administratively within some kind of an organization. And so they're attached administratively, but they're completely autonomous. The authority for Lahaina would be completely autonomous. The HCDA would only provide support staff to the community authority, but the community authority, what they decide to do, what their agenda is, how they want to do it, that's all on them and them alone. There's no control from DBED. There's no control from the from HCDA at all. But HCDA is administratively attached to DBED, but HCDA completely does their own thing because there's several CDAs within HCDA. There's one for Heia, which is a wetland area, up on the windward side of Oahu. And that one, it's autonomous. They make all the decisions for Heia are all done by the community representatives from Heia. It, the CD, even though they they get support from the HCDA staff to do the things that they need to do in so far as projects and such, there's no, they have no, there's no oversight and involvement from everybody. They, the community group decides what, if, and how, and when they're gonna do things. So, uh, Anders, you bring up a, a, an interesting point that uh, the in, initial intent was to empower the local residents. It certainly did not seem that in terms of what went out in the community, in terms of mm -hmm. how it was presented. It looked like it was a power grab by the state. But what I'm hearing you say, the intent was not that at all. No, uh, not at all. In fact, as I said to others, you know, I should hate the bill more than anybody because it's only over state resources in Lahaina or the 26 Ahupuaha, which are collectively known as Lele. And so, um, or, but in Lahaina generally, right? What would happen is instead of me deciding in the, the legislature, this is the amount of money we're going to get for this, for this school, this is the projects we're going to do because this is the ones I'm going to support it would be take that power away from me and give it to the community. And that's awesome. The more we can put power in the hands of people in Lahaina or Kihei or Paia or wherever they are, the more better. If the state DOE or BOE has to answer to the community, if the DOT has to answer to the community, the DLNR has to answer the community, and the way they answer the community is the control of the money is in the community. So the community is like, no, you won't spend it on this commercial thing. You're going to spend it on this. No, you, we're going to, you know, we want this to be where the state needs to focus. And so that's kind of the idea behind it. But the biggest piece of the puzzle missing in this and the biggest, the, the last time we had this conversation was like 30 years ago when I was a staffer and all hell broke loose then. Let me let everybody know. Everybody was flipped out about the township, Lahaina Township, as it was called. And the biggest one being the county, the county mayor, former mayor Lingle at the time, county council, they went bonkers over the idea of the autonomy of West Maui by having a township at that level. Because the county plan has through the planning commission has a lot of control over what will happen in Lahaina with zoning and rebuilding. And then, of course, you got a lot of the infrastructure in the area is county owned. And yet the, this authority would only be for state things. So it'll only be for Mala, Lahaina ramp, only be for the schools, only for the smattering of some lands up above and that's it, nothing else. So a big chunk of the conversation of, a, of autonomy, if you're gonna talk about you know community empowered government, 
that's actually structurally empowered at the, the levels that government is. You have to have this discussion about the county and where they fit into the role of this new entity. And that was missing from this bill, which is why this bill was kind of a quarter of a loaf, right? And it, I think every, a lot, it needed more discussion than the 60-day session can give it. And you know what? But at least we got the got it going. We got a conversation going about it. And the conversation for this year, the bill is dead. And whether it comes back in future years, I joke with somebody, well, in the year from now, when they would look at self-governance again for West Maui, they can come back to this bill. Just like I came back to the township thing, you know. And you know, sometimes it, you know, we it, we you know, I could have been I mean, the conspiracy theories and just the hate fest that came out of it was, was wild. But what got me was like, you know what? Is it gotten to a point in our society where things are so shrill, like uh, the video we referred to from uh, that my friend there from South Maui, where they become so shrill and polarizing that you can't have a discussion of a potential, you know, potential vision or potential idea? The both the good, the bad, the unintended. And that's what democracy is supposed to be, supposed to be able to freely exchange ideas and come to a consensus where everybody feels like their point was heard. And the bill wasn't heard by the House. And I think that speaks to that. So, yeah. So, so a question then, uh, you, you mentioned in terms of distribution of funds coming from the federal government then through the state and then finally trickling down to the county in some way. Uh, is is uh, could you explain the way these billions of dollars that are coming in uh, to the state uh, from the federal government, how that money is being distributed? And, yeah, under the under this bill, or just now under the or the universe uh, now? Uh, uh, now and 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 what and what resolution does the residents have? Do we have here in the county? But don't have any control. I mean, first of all, there's no the feds aren't spending anything. We're spending everything. The state of Hawaii is the taxpayers are putting the money up on the table for everything. We're getting reimbursed. And that is what's proving to be the huge issue because things that were assumed to be reimbursable at 90, 10 or 100 percent are either now proving to be unreimbursable by the federal government or the federal government isn't going to re reimburse us for all of it which makes the 90-10 now all of a sudden more like a 50-50 or 60-40 split. So that's the thing is the money that we're, the way it works is the federal money for a lot of it is getting reimbursed back to the state of Hawaii. But the state, you and me and everybody out there who lives in Hawaii is paying up front for it. And so that's why it's been the, the issue of FEMA and the federal reimbursements have been basically a huge one on the state budget, because we have to assume the worst case scenario is we're not going to get reimbursed at the rate we were intended or we won't be reimbursed for certain things. And the longer we move in without getting this is why it's so critical we transition into housing and into the next phases and identify those areas in Lahaina that can be rebuilt and get people back in, especially renters. Renters make up over 80% of displaced survivors right now. <clears throat> and there needs to be a real focus on that to get the federal money, but to pull the money down. And that's why I've seen the county and the state not pulling down the money now. <laughs> Hello, Mr. So, um, uh, Bruce and Ann, do you have any other questions? Because yeah, that was a, that was a big guess... one for me. Angus, the uh, bill started out, tell me how it started out and how it evolved into who selects uh, who this board is. It, it, it started, is off of a, started off of just as a traditional, you know, like one of the other existing CDAs, like hey, uh, is done where it's appointed, you know, appointed by the governor with some from the House and the Senate, and then they're confirmed by the by the Senate. Um, and then they would sit on this board. And the, the idea of an appointed board is that's the that's how all the other ones are structured. So that's why that was the starting point. But a lot of the distrust and fear from the community is that the governor now would be picking them and that those people on the board would be loyal to the governor and not beholden to the community. So then after the first hearing, it was like, okay, people wanted an elected board. So they know that the board, or at least in their mind, that the board isn't being appointed by somebody in Honolulu and the people on that board are connected, right? 
they're connected to the governor, they're connected to special interests or large landowners or other things. And so that's why it went to a elected board. But one of the, but as it went through, you know, as people started talking about it, especially some of these workshops, the concern came up well with an elected board, especially one that's volunteer. And that was made volunteer because of the concern of money coming into it. Of, you know, of, if you have large salaries for the community board members that people would be, you know, who have influence would be trying to get on there. So it's a volunteer board, but of elected volunteer board, but you could have a board literally of eight of the same kind of representation. And, the, the, you know, how do you guarantee Native Hawaiian representation will always be there? You can't do it on an elected board because of the constitutional parameters, but you can on an appointed board. So one of the ideas being discussed, you know, before, you know, when the bill crossed over and the bill again didn't get heard on the House side, so it really couldn't come out for a discussion is maybe create an appointed board insofar as the positions in there are dedicated, like you have three for Native Hawaiian cultural, two for, you know, historical, one for business, one for the you know, Filipino community, et cetera. But then the, the, the electorate would approve or ratify the nominees of it. But see, this is why this bill, this idea needs much more time and conversation. It's, these are the kinds of issues that still need to be discussed and worked out and the, the pros and cons need to be balanced. But that's how it went from an appointed, which is the, how the CDAs are done now, just by statute, to an elected one. But some of the concerns that were coming out in about an elected one, which is why the idea of an appointed ratified one was starting to emerge. But and was this all? We got to the hearing, so there wasn't a chance to discuss some of the the concerns that came up with the elected, as well as appointed, as well as compensation, as well as trying to have public financing be the only allowable mechanism for electioneering in this new authority, because that the idea was. In my mind, it should be public. If you're going to have spending in a political type of thing, it should be all publicly financed so nobody's spending their own money at all, period. And, we, that's, and I know that's kind of a silver medal for the bill we really wanted that we passed over, you know, the, the global public financing one. But I thought, OK, this is a good place perhaps to start global public financing in this area to show that it will work and to show that once you take money out of politics completely, it's going to be about the battle of the ideas, hopefully. So, weren't um, they lacking the third? Was it thirty million or was it three hundred? I can't recall the million dollars in in uh, initiating this whole program for public campaign financing. Well, for the uh, that budget for, was cut severely. Yeah, yeah. Get on the house side, they deferred the bill outright. So I don't know if they if they did, just didn't fund it in the house version of the budget. But it died on the House side before uh, we sent it over from ours, and then it went ahead and died over there. So, I mean, that, that's too bad. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we should have had that two years ago. Yep. Well, they had all that time to amend it, too. Oh, yeah. Two exactly. years plus, and they made no effort in doing so. So, so what's the real nitty-gritty behind this whole thing of clean elections, and how come this type of thing has not really gotten much traction uh, in our state house, uh, I can't speak for those guys. Well, I can. I just think because leadership there is very conservative, and they just don't, you know, support progressive things like this. And so they just it keeps dying over there, and they won't. Get, I mean, to me, it's like at least give it, give it a fair hearing. Let it go all the way to conference. So, who are the main blockers of uh, the clean elections? That, that you saw? Uh, well, it died in the House Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs Committee. So the, the, I guess the chair recommended not to move it. So I would, so I would go ahead. So it would be uh, Shiitake, is that? Uh, who, who... No, no, it, it's, uh, it, it's uh, his name is the Representative Tarnas is the chair's name. And then Jackson Sayama is the vice chair's name. Okay. But, yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, uh, any other questions about the clean elections uh, and its demise at this point in time? <laughs> any any hope for it in the future? Is it going to be re? Uh, yeah, they'll definitely be reintroduced next year, for sure. 
I mean, it's it's like I mean, it's definitely be reinsured reintroduced next year, and you know, it it's it's no reason why it shouldn't pass. I'm sorry. I mean, it, it's anyway. What about what about other bills that affect Lahaina? There's uh, certainly around uh, uh, transition vacations. Uh, HB uh, I guess one eight three eight. And, the, yeah, uh, the short term, the short term rentals um, bill um, that uh, that's basically makes it crystal clear that the counties have total authority over short term rentals, um, including the ability to amortize existing ones if they're non compliant in so far as county community general planning goes. Um, it, it's a global move to basically make it clear in statute and HRS that the county has total authority over through its zoning powers over short-term rentals, including amortization if they choose to do it. How There's been one concern raised, uh, Lahaina Strong brought up that the ver current version of the bill, because it was modeled after Honolulu City Council Ordinance 227, I think the number is, that it only is for single family homes. Oh. And I discussed that with the chair of the committee that heard the bill and he goes, no, it's supposed to be global. Everything in the counties, it's everything is their kuleana and i go well i think it's only single family home so he's looking at that to make sure we can get that taken out so that the county we the county the idea is the county has complete authority and the ability insofar as short-term rentals go um our role with short-term rentals is of, of taxation side general excise and transit accommodation tax uh, there was a discussion of the aspen tax model um potentially being you know implemented at the state level but it never really got any traction at least on our end so so is that uh much different from senate bill 2919 uh, no it's actually it, it's now identical to senate bill 2919 because they replaced the contents of the house bill with the senate bill but see. yeah <laughs> that that thing again <laughs> But I mean, the, the, the 2291 was supposed to be, the, the idea is global uh, authority over everything SDR to the counties unequivocally. But, given, but that means giving them the tools to remove short-term rentals where they shouldn't be because they're incongruent with the zoning of the area. So that gives a, a little bit more home rule to the county? Uh, Is there a way, yeah, a lot of home rule of the county. That's why we shouldn't limit it to only single family homes. I mean, there, there may be areas where it's considered to be incongruent and some of those multi, you know, those, you know, condo or apartment type buildings, if they're not STRs, if they're amortized out, then they could potentially become long term rental options. Great. Uh, Has there been any real progress in that uh, that bill in the county to um, convert long term to short? I mean, short term to long term rentals. It was a volunteer program, right? And I thought there was. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know either. I don't know if they got any takers. Uh, I don't. It, that was, and I, I mean, I, that was a glo that was a global one for all long term rentals, right? Not just not just fire survivor ones, or was that? Because I know there all was one them, I thought that we're going to in Maui. <laughs> all of them out to convince them to go from short to long term to term rentals for a, at least a year. Oh. Yeah, the problem is, is that you know, again, it's the the offer that was thrown out to pay day rates for for this, which started with you know FEMA first, the state, and then FEMA. Like we'll pay day rates. Well. That makes it very, you take away the incentive to convert from a short to long-term rental. I mean, unless you're paying day rates, which means that a long-term rental is 5,000 a month for a studio. 7,000 for one bedroom, 9,000 for a two bedroom and three bedrooms, what, 12,000 a month, 15,000 a month. So so this has had a huge impact on our rental rates here for, for oh, yeah. the residents. I mean, it's unbelievable how uh, if, their lease is expired and now they're able to get three times the amount of rent that they normally would have received. Uh, it's it's really putting a crimp then on really the economy of, of the 
of, of all of Maui, and especially yeah. our crisis we're facing right now with housing. So, yeah. Uh, we have, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Paul. So, so do you see this, the repercussions? What do you see in terms of? I, I see it firsthand. I, I put in my own bill. Um, it didn't make it all the way, it made it to the house, but they chose, there was two bills, rent control bills that went over to the house. One basically caps it right away on August 7th rates. The other one basically caps all of the rents um, at the year's rates. However, the county council has to approve the cap and they can increase it for uh, uh, cost of living uh, adjustments. So that in case the emergency goes two, three years, et cetera, right? Down the road. But this the number one, even FEMA said the number one thing you guys need to do ASAP is to put in some kind of rent control, rent cap, like they have in San Francisco, because it's out of control and it's we it's basically it's sucking everybody dry right now. It's killing everybody. You got you're right. All the stories we hear about, and, and by the way, all your listeners out there, if you know of a landlord that's refusing to re re renew the thing, if you know they're going month to month with the idea they're going to sign up with FEMA, call the attorney general's office and let them know because FEMA says if they find out that any of the housing brokers acquired a property at the expense of an existing tenant, they will exclude that person permanently from all federal programs. They now have a FEMA contact number to report that. Good. Okay. Because we brought yeah. that up on, on our in our meeting with them in the fact that to way to combat the hyperinflation that's going on right now. But again, it's, I call it FEMA fever. It's like a gold rush. People expect the golden ticket from Willy Wonka. People expect that you know I'm going to find a I'm going to find a fire survivor. The golden tickets arrived. Yay! You know, thirteen thousand a month plus no property tax. That's it. I know it's it's unbelievable, you know. There, there's there's this whole thing about disaster capitalism, and uh, it seems that there are seven major contractors that are receiving the FEMA money, uh, and they then distribute distribute it to other uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. um, now I've heard that some of those contracts were FEMA, were actually signed. Uh, the week before the fire. Do you know anything about these um, uh, contracts that were signed by these vendors uh, for uh, dealing with the uh, removal of rubble and, and you know, and, and the disaster capitalism that resulted from all of this? No, I don't know of any in this being signed before the fire. Do you know, however, disaster capitalism is alive and well and that the contractor who got it is a contractor from the mainland utilizing a shell corp from Oahu as a way to run work through all of these unlicensed and non-union workers and companies, all of whom are going to come flooding into Maui and add to our rental woes and everything else during the rebuild. And that to me has been the, that's the, that's the control of Washington right there. This alone, to bring everything full circle, you know, I mean, maybe you can't get control over those guys, but a lot of this has to do with the fact these decisions are made in D.C., but they come to Honolulu and they consult with people in Honolulu and they come back. So we consulted with everybody out there. We, what's the problem? <laughs> and that's why you see this runaway disaster. Look at the new school. Hey, there's disaster capitalism right there. You got those boxes that were made, rent being leased from a company in the mainland, non-union. They allegedly leak because the roofs are flat oh. and they're they're costing basically like 40 million plus for those things and they're basically ripping the community off of a school because they're trying to now say that this is going to be the new king community of third elementary when no there's supposed to be a new school built there by the developer as part of his approval to build that 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 area to begin with and you can't just simply rebuild, build a school for the guy using federal money, which was obligated to do, and say, oh, there's King Kamehameha in third elementary, everybody. We're done. Because that leaves us a school short and robs the community of a school that was in Lahaina for generations. So there's disaster capitalism 102 for you right there. Thanks. Um, you know, I read a recent op-ed, Angus, about 
you know, your your criticism of having these homes, temporary homes built in, in the Maui Lani area for Lahaina mm -hmm. fire survivors. And I'm thinking, that's crazy how far away that is. Is there a lack of land? I mean, I know there's a lot of state land. In no, there's there, 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 yeah, there's plenty of land. There's, there's land behind villages that were working with DHS and with um, Hawaiian homes on utilizing some of that. Kana Poly 2020 should be and has been, and we've given entitlements to that be supposed to be the next area for workforce affordable housing to be done. Uh, those are the areas right there. There's land available in there in West Maui. You pull people out of West Maui, this voluntary relocation, you're, you're destroying the fabric of the community. Absolutely. You're separating people from their friends, their families. They're no longer just a stone's throw away or a five minute drive away. They're on the other other part of the island. They still have kids in school. They got to go to Lahaina schools because they're on scholarship. They've got jobs over there. And now because of all of this extra traffic, they and many of them don't have cars still. And yes, so they'll that was turn bad. around and say, we're going to stick everybody forcibly. I'm, I'm sorry, it sounds a lot like the Middle East. We're going to voluntarily relocate you to central Maui. And, you know, and, and that's, where you, that's, and that's gonna, where you guys are going to be. And, and, you know, isn't that great? No, that tears everybody out of West Maui. It stops the debris removal process because only residents were supposed to be working on debris removal. It adds traffic and chokes the place out, which slows everything down, the kids to school. And if we have another fire, when we have another fire, I mean, it's, it's insane that they would propose that. And the, that the cost was like $100 million for, you know, that most of it was to put high voltage lines and infrastructure into that area, which, by the way, was promised to the surrounding community was going to remain in open space after Mayor Arakawa bought it, the, had the county buy it, remember, because it was supposed to be a failed affordable. So you have everybody's pissed off around there going, wait a second, that was <laughs> the county purchased this as open space. Not for so those so, are just considered to be temporary in the in the Maui Lani area, right? Yeah, but they're putting in infrastructure that is like and they already started doing it before they even announced the thing. They're putting in the kind of heavy duty infrastructure that there's going to be housing there after it's done. Thanks. What, uh, uh, Angus, what, what are some of the other bills or the legislation from the House also that uh, would really have a positive impact for the Lahaina residents and recovery efforts? I, I think the, the rent control ones will be huge. Positive. I think the ones that we're doing to try to force the governor to put, make emergency proclamation, mortgage forbearance is the big one. People are literally being foreclosed mm -hmm. on for paying mortgages on homes they don't own right now. Uh, we're doing a lot of things to try to really um, allow the counties, for instance, to be able to use additional monies for infrastructure for housing. I'm trying to, we're, we also have, bills in there to allow people who have their own units now as they get brought back on they can go ahead and rent out an existing part of their unit without needing to get a new rezoning done um there's a new i can send you a grid of all the bills that are alive still um and you guys can put it post it up on the maui pono website it'll list everything that's there that's good for maui good for west maui good for maui as a whole uh, and some good bills, just generally speaking, you know, things are looking at trying to improve things like mental health care. We have bills moving to, to expand mental health care access, which is critical. We're melting down on that. We've got bills to try to go ahead and look at trying to speed up and get a handle on this unexpended capital improvement project backlog in the Department of Education. Which is which is insane. So I'll send all that to you guys in a grid, and you can post it up on your website and yeah. share with everybody everything that we that is right so. now moving um, that people can look at, and then we can do follow up sessions, talk stories like this if you want uh, on particular bills. Great, I, I, I greatly appreciate that. Yes, yeah, anytime you guys want, anytime you guys want, we'd love to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Uh, it's uh, we've, we've been on this for about a half hour, uh, Angus, and I know that you have other things that you need to do, but I'm just wondering, uh, Ann or Bruce, do you have any other questions of Angus? Well, let me include, let me go back to 3381, the Lele bill. And uh, what really got people the most is that those that, that board was selected by the mayor. 
and not elected by the local people. And was that how you originally presented it? Because that was a model that it followed for other uh, HCD uh, bills or? Yeah, it was actually the governor. And that's what really got people upset to your point. But that's the that's how it's followed in other CDA that have been set up to your point. Correct. Like that. Then it got changed in after the hearing and people communicated that into an elected board. So the last iteration, it was an elected board, not an appointed board anymore at all. And would, would you have been able to introduce that as an elected board originally? Sure. No, I know uh, it been a I could, I could sticking have, point. I could have started from that position from the very beginning. But in the very beginning, it was like, okay, this is an existing one. This is the starting starting point. In my mind, I kind of didn't see the nefariousness of, you know, a governor picking only people. And it's a concern, though. It's a genuine concern. You, would they pick only people who are politically loyal to them? What I saw it as is, okay, you need nine people who are so committed to Lahaina and to doing this, which is a full-time job, that they're going to commit in years. And I've been to community meetings in Lahaina my whole life, and i got to tell you, sometimes it's hard finding nine people even in the room. And so my whole thing is, and, and my whole thing is, I'm sorry, we got to make sure we have our Native Hawaiian people got to be on, a permanent fixture on this uh, authority. And so that was kind of why, like, okay, this way we can ensure we're getting the pillars of our community, people, the community from the big, all these major groups in the community will be on this board. And it's like, once you see faces in these positions, then the fear dispels. You're, there's nine faceless people in a new entity. There's a lot of fear with that. It could be the worst of the worst, or it could be Theo and Keomoku and Payele and, you know what I'm saying? And then when you put names, oh, I know those guys. They wouldn't condemn my property. I'll slap them in the head. I see them at Foodland. You know what I'm saying? So I think part of it, this is why I think a working group would have been an ideal outcome if the bill were to continue to move because then you start getting this kind of dialogue and you're getting faces to beginning to appear insofar as who might actually be on this board and the bill starts to be reconstructed along the lines of okay how do we ensure that the groups in Lahaina the, the people that have been working as community leaders in Lahaina and that more importantly the demographics they represent we'll have a voice on this board. So it's a Lahaina for all, right? Of all who were there. And quite frankly, you know, the Lahaina I grew up in as a kid was wiped, pretty much wiped away from us. I mean, Lahaina was looking more like um, Newport Beach these days. And, you know, if there was a way to possibly turn the time, the clock back by giving the community control over the disaster money, that to basically provide a guiding hand on how to revision a Lahaina that where the community, the streets are safe, the Kapuna can be, can walk without fear, the children can play with each other, and we can have social equity where there's affordable workforce housing right on the water, footsteps away from a new Lahaina where small businesses can flourish and not makeup stores can be seen. <laughs> So, can, so, so <laughs> not a makeup store in sight. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the question I have, Angus, is, uh, you know, you this was a bill that really was uh, initiated by the state. Can we have something similar to what you're saying, where you have those people who would have, um, you know, a lot of of say in terms of the direction and flow of what occurs in terms of the rebuild, that would be more county directed and, and county. i think i think it, i think it needs to be led from the county i honestly do and the, the, the last time this was done it was with the township model where things got sideways is it came up on the state level and of course the county was upset but the county was upset because they recognized that the the the, the bell cow of tax revenue west maui was going to become autonomous and take its money potentially with it and, you know, and that's why I think the huge backlash, you know, occurred. But I think it has to happen at the county level. I would love to see this conversation continue there. The most of the 
areas and the concerns and the challenges and everything are really based around county infrastructure and county and the role of the planning commission and the role of condemnation eminent domain the county has that power right now they have that ability right now some of the things being discussed in so far as street widenings and things like that are our county roads so i think this is a conversation that hopefully will continue at the county level and maybe there can be a future where we can have this kind of government resources and decision making back to the community level but the state ha i'd like to see the state come along with it because of the fact that you now have a global community and you don't have well all of this can be the community's deciding but that they can't because the state still controls it you see what i'm saying so and, and it, it's not going to be an easy fix it's going to be when you do something new it's there's going to be a lot of growing pains a lot of discussions a lot of consternation a lot of concerns and i don't you know i dismiss the conspiracy theories but the concerns are valuable but they're worth discussing right mm -hmm. i i agree and i and, and again i i hope that uh you know the initial intent uh be taken up by the county itself so that again they are empowered and we have home rule to help determine what happens in lahaina and it comes from the residents themselves. And I think so. I, I think so. I would support the county continuing the conversation in the future. I think that we had the conversation at this level and it appears with all the discussion that there has to be a very robust, intimate involvement at the county level. Maybe that's where it should start or continue if it's going to continue at all. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, Thank you so much, Angus, for Thank this you. time. Uh, Any time, you guys, if you want to schedule another one, please let me know. I love to do this, and I can then counter the messaging coming out from my buddy there in South Maui. <laughs> that, that's right. Very good. But but that's what we have to Challenge do. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Thank you, Thank, you so much. Thank you guys for everything you're doing. You're awesome. Please feel free to call me or text me or, or, or give Wendy and Beth a call anytime. Uh, or anybody in the community has concerns and stuff, theme or whatever, please give our office a shout, okay? okay. Thanks for coming out on the holiday. Prince yeah, Cujo. always, man, always. Okay, have a good Thank one. You, I guess. See what fun they have for us. Okay, bye. Aloha.